from the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. It's been five years since the Phoenix VA scandal broke, revealing hundreds of veterans died while waiting for appointments. So have they made any progress? We're in Flagstaff right now giving you the latest on the museum fire and an inside look into the fire camp. Officials saying that there is a concern for flooding. And if lizards can regrow their tails, can humans regrow their limbs? The research scientists are doing to try to make that happen. Cronkite News starts now. Firefighters are making progress battling the museum fire burning near Flagstaff. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Matthew Helgeson. And I'm Jesse Jopali. Thank you for joining us. Authorities say light rain will help crews working to contain the nearly 1900 acre blaze. But there is a risk of flash flooding from monsoon storms tonight. Cronkite News reporter Marcella Baietho is in Flagstaff right now tracking the fire, which remains only 10% contained. Marcella? I'm about eight miles away from the museum fire here in Flagstaff and officials saying that regardless that the weather is clearing up, flooding is still a concern. This team has been brought in to manage the fire itself. And that team is staying here in Fort Tuthill where fire officials and emergency personnel have set up their command center to fight the fire that today is just two miles north of Flagstaff. According to officials, the museum fire has charred through more than 1,800 acres and is at 10% containment. Nearly 120 people are stationed at this fire camp, sleeping, eating, and living, all while trying to combat the blaze. This is basically the command post where we feed the firefighters who are working and the overhead, the people who are managing the fire. Incident technology specialist Chris Dawson has been camping out in his car, helping with the fire efforts for the past four days. He doesn't know when he'll be able to see his kids back at home. It's a lot like home. It's our extended family, you know, so it's, uh, it's pretty easy. We, get, we wake up, we go to work right away when we wake up. We got breakfast, lunch, and dinner served to us. Um, but you're working 16 hours a day. Fire officials and personnel say they don't know when their operations will wrap up. But in the meantime, many have found a form of family right here on the campgrounds. According to fire officials, evacuations have been lifted. Here in Flagstaff, Marcelo Vallado, Cronkite News. Social media is lighting up tonight with people sharing incredible images and photos of the museum fire. Marcella tweeted this video of the plumes of smoke rising into the skies. And Paul captured this photo of a rainbow shining down on the mountain with the caption, a nice rainstorm fell right over the fire. Did not put it out, but slowed it down. And finally, check out these NAU football players helping with supplies. Really shows their love for the community and proves that what they do off the field is just as important to the team as what they do on the field. Nikisha Johnson is standing by now with a look at the fire forecast for tonight and tomorrow. Nikisha? It looks like Flagstaff is going to be getting more storms tonight and tomorrow. This includes rain showers, thunderstorms, and winds between 5 and 10 miles per hour. This may affect their museum fire they are currently in. We hope that the rain helps firefighters contain the fire, but with rain also comes flash flooding. So if you're in Flagstaff or nearby, please stay safe over the next couple days. For your full weather report, stay tuned. It'll be up in just a moment. A call center has been set up for people with questions about this raging wildfire, and those who live in the area are encouraged to sign up for emergency notifications by going to this website, coconino.az.gov ready. Spaces that some would consider unconventional are being used to more and more to host migrants seeking asylum. Just this week, a nonprofit in Tucson received the green light to move operations from a church to a juvenile detention center. And today we got a tour of what was once a school, but will now be used for tra transitioning migrants. Reporter Tania Williamson joins us at the digital desk with more. Tania? The Anna Elementary School has been closed since 2007, but its hallways will soon fill up again. And it won't be by students this time. Instead, migrant families will be the ones who are occupying the space. Workers and volunteers with the International Rescue Committee are preparing to receive migrant families in what was the Anna Ott Elementary School, but will now be known as the Phoenix Welcome Center. There's always been a discussion around how could we do better if we had a space that was really customized to the needs of these families. And so our relationship and agreement with the school district really allows us to customize this space to, to fit the needs of the families, and we're very excited to, to move forward with that. For example, this former classroom will now instead be able to house up to 10 people at a time. The IRC had been working 
working out of a day center before being approved for this new space. But one of the limitations of that facility was that it did not have overnight access um, or it was not intended to. And so we were looking for a, a more permanent facility that would have that overnight access as part of the design. And so we, uh, we found this facility as, a, as an opportunity to go ahead and build into it. As the committee awaits approval for further construction, IRC representatives say they hope this new facility will help in easing some of the weight that's been carried by other local organizations that have also helped migrant families transition after they seek asylum. There are so many aspects of this that seemed really perfect for what we're looking to do. And, you know, and the school district really wasn't sure what to do with this building moving forward other than storage. So this has just been perfect time, perfect place. Before it was approved, there was pushback from a neighborhood association to not allow the school to be transformed into a migrant shelter. There is an inspection tomorrow, and if passed, the center could start hosting migrant families as early as next week. Live at the Digital Desk, Tanaya Williamson, Cronkite News. U.S. Representative Debbie Lesko introduced six bills this week that are aimed to getting to the root of the border crisis. Three of the bills focus on cutting down asylum applications by increasing the credible fear standard. One bill would authorize funds for more detention beds. Another would provide more immigration judges to reduce the backlog of asylum claims. The final bill would allow authorities to detain a small segment of criminal immigrants for extended periods. It's been five years since the VA hospital in Phoenix made national headlines. When reports surfaced saying workers were falsifying records to make it look like veterans were treated quickly, when in fact, some waited months for care. So what's happened to wait times at the VA since then? Cronkite News reporter Julian Paras is live in our Washington bureau with the details. Today's hearing before the House Veterans Affairs Committee had none of the fireworks of hearings five years ago when the Phoenix VA wait time scandal first broke. That's because VA officials and lawmakers agreed that things, for the most part, are getting better. We have a lot of work to do still, but we are on a great trajectory as our veterans have been telling us that they are more than 77 percent of them are satisfied and they trust us. Boyd said wait times for many VA services now rival or beat those of private practices. Critical referrals to a specialist that used to take almost 20 days now take 1.4 days, she said, well within the target of 48 hours. Boyd wasn't the only one praising the VA's progress. One senior committee member said the numbers of what the VA has been able to accomplish speaks for themselves. Last year alone, VA completed more than one million more appointments than it had the year before. In many cases, those appointments occurred faster within VA than they would have, would have in the private sector, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association. But some lawmakers are still skeptical of the numbers. Why don't you measure wait times from the time the veteran asks for an appointment and the time he or she receives an appointment? That's the only answer I want. Why is it that you don't measure it that way? An expert from the Government Accountability Office said the problem of wait times has dogged the VA for years. While the agency has clearly made progress, she said, it is an ongoing struggle. I mean, we still are concerned about the reliability of the wait time measures. And I think the getting back to the scheduler training, this is something that needs to be ongoing and persistent. It's not a one time and done. But witnesses from the VA said they have done the job they are sworn to do, serve their veteran communities in a timely fashion. And they are confident the improvements will continue as they move forward. We have a trajectory, we have a sense of urgency, we have improvements in our scheduling uh, packages as well as our community care networks. While things are better, they're not perfect. One lawmaker told of a vet who needed urgent mental health care but was turned away from two separate VA clinics. We reached out to veterans groups in Arizona to get their take on how well the VA is doing, but have not heard back. In Washington, Julian Paras, Cronkite News. The Arizona Supreme Court has rejected a contractor group's argument that a ballot measure to halt expansion of Phoenix's light rail system should be kept off an August election ballot because of how people were paid to collect voter signatures. The justices also rejected arguments that the initiative description's wording was flawed. If voters approve the measure, any planned rail extensions will be stopped and funds will be, go to other transportation projects. Coming up on Cronkite News, it's one of the most anticipated congressional hearings in decades. Robert Mueller talks about the Russia investigation for the first time and takes back a bombshell statement he made about President Trump. Also. Your meth could go bad in Arizona heat. The hilarious warning one local cop shop put out on social media today. A popping bubble gum. 
it was almost like a badge of honor that you had to uh, bring your culture with you to the table. That's why Bob Wills and his guys brought us Western music. That's why Hank Williams brought the South with him from Honky Tonks. Johnny Cash brought the black lamb dirt of Arkansas. Bill Monroe brought music out of Kentucky bluegrass music. Willie Nelson brought his poetry from Texas. Patsy Klein brought her heartache from Virginia. I mean, it, it was the most wonderful parade of sons and daughters of America that brought their hearts and their souls and their experiences and it gave us a great era in country music. At the Grand Ole Opry every Saturday night. Spanish speaking division of Cronkite News. Covering topics such as economics, education, sustainability, immigration, and border relations. Cronkite Noticias strives to serve the Spanish-speaking community in Arizona. Under the guidance of prominent Spanish-speaking professionals, students at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism develop content for our broadcast partner, Univision, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Explore Cronkite Noticias at cronkitenoticias.azpbs.org. Formal special counsel Robert Mueller spent the morning answering questions from the House Judiciary Committee and being grilled by the House Intelligence Committee. The full day of testimony marks the first time Mueller has answered questions about his investigation into President Donald Trump. Mueller opened his remarks by saying his team, quote, did not reach a determination as to whether the president committed a crime, end quote. That clarifies a statement he made earlier in the day where he said he did not charge the president because the Department of Justice does not allow it. Earlier, he told the House Judiciary Committee his investigation did not, quote, totally exonerate President Trump as the president has claimed. He disappointed Republicans by refusing to address anything related to the origins of the counterintelligence investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. He's not corruptly acting in order to see that justice is done. What he's doing is not obstructing justice. He is pursuing justice, and the fact that you ran it out it. two years means you perpetuated injustice. Meanwhile, House Democrats in favor of impeaching the president hope the hearing will con convince both the public and skeptical Democrats an impeachment inquiry should move forward. The report laid out multiple offers of Russian help to the Trump campaign, the campaign's acceptance of that help, and overt acts in furtherance of Russian help. To most Americans, that is the very definition of collusion, whether it is a crime or not. Many feel Mueller's firsthand narrative of the investigation can move the needle on impeachment, even if it provides no new details. At the same time, Republicans hope his testimony will provide there is nothing more to know and squash calls for impeachment. In other national news, Puerto Rico Governor Ricardo Rosello is expected to resign today. That's according to a source familiar with the situation. Puerto Rico's Secretary of Justice is expected to take his place. Word of Rosea's resignation comes after more than a week of protests in the U.S. territory that erupted after the publication of offensive group chat messages between the governor and members of his inner circle. Arizona law enforcement has made national headlines in the past couple of months, and sometimes it's not always been in the best light. The recent social media posts from agencies like the Yuma Police Department show they're trying to connect with the community in a different kind of way. Cronkite News reporter Gabriela Collage is here to give us the inside scoop. We've all seen Arizona Department of Transportation's hilarious electronic highway messages, but police departments have now jumped on, in on this trend, showing they too can have a sense of humor. A social media post from Yuma Police Department sparking thousands of Facebook reactions, hundreds of comments, and counting. The post reads, public service announcement. Due to extreme heat conditions, there's a possibility that your meth, if exposed to this heat, could go bad. Because we care, the Yuma Police Department is offering free testing of your meth. We will even come to you and test it. For everyone who takes advantage of this offer, we will ensure you get a set of orange jammies, flip-flops, and a full collar 8x10 to share with your family. Hashtag don't meth with Yuma. Hashtag don't do drugs. Hashtag we care. Hashtag jammies. It's not your typical police post, and that's the point. Because we've built such a rapport with our community, they come to us, they talk to us, they give us tips. Um, and that's what all this is about, is, is just building community relations so that 
our community trusts us enough to come to us, to talk to us. The post's getting tons of reactions, many of them mixed. Facebook members like Shauna Kroll saying, Best public announcement ever. Thank you YPD for protecting our community. However, another user commented, you should be out fighting crime instead of stuffing your face with donuts and making memes. Despite some of the criticism, Sergeant Franklin says Yuma police wants to show there's more to their officers than just a badge. You know, sometimes they throw a little humor out there so that people understand that, hey, we're human too. We have a sense of humor. Um, it, it helps make us more approachable and, you know, helps people see us as human beings. And Sergeant Franklin says the reactions to the post continue to come in and the offer for anyone to have their meth tested still stands. Gabriella Collage, Cronkite News. Up next, can humans regrow limbs like lizards regrow tails? The answer may surprise you. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Before Professor Halden, I had an insane amount of passion, but I almost felt helpless because I didn't know how to use it. Professor Halden gave me a chance to make a difference. Being at a place like ASU allows you to take these big leaps. Ultimately, the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved alone. Lizards can regenerate their tails, but how is that possible? And why can't other species, like humans? A team of researchers from ASU and two other institutions discovered important new clues about how these reptiles are able to do this, and what they found could translate to human therapy in the future. After a long day, Tammy Borgard loves to unwind in her pool. Just sitting, relaxing, and floating. In October 2010, I got in a motorcycle accident. Somebody T-boned me, and I had angels around where I was at. They held my arteries until the medics came, and, and then we uh, amputated, and the rest is history. Scientists want to help amputees like Tammy avoid the discomfort of implants and attachments. That's why biologists at the Kusami lab are using genomic sequencing to uncover which regenerative genes come into play when lizards regrow their tails. Reptiles, including lizards, are more closely related to mammals, which include humans, and so they have that capability to regenerate appendages and are more closely related to the humans than any other regeneration model itself. Humans can also regenerate the peripheral nerves. The issue is that, you know, uh, functionality isn't restored. And so luckily in these lizards around 120 and 250 days, the nerves are also maturing, but also we begin to see that function is restored. Their research focuses on a special type of cell known as satellite cells that are vital to the healing process. Satellite cells are muscle stem cells. We all have them. Basically, all complex organisms have them, and they're really critical for muscle repair. The hope is that we can take what we've learned from the lizard satellite cells and eventually, you know, in the future, translate it to human work, because the reality is that we share the same genes. So the pathways that the lizard satellite cells are activating are pathways that we have. They're very conserved, uh, and so it's really just a matter of accessing that or tapping into that. Being able to regrow bone and cartilage could help patients like Tammy move around more smoothly. Um, so regarding the lizard stuff, I mean, that would be awesome. 
I would love to see it for, for the legs, the limbs. Although their research is exciting, the scientists warn that translating lizard research into human health care is not as simple as tweaking a couple of genes here or there. But I think it is important that we understand, you know, what's actually going on at the molecular level and the cellular level to kind of identify why lizards have this and have maintained this ability to regenerate appendages versus why humans can't. In the meantime, Tammy is staying active with the limbs she still has. Technology is amazing, and if somebody can take that challenge and see if it'll work for them, I say go for it. If it works, I, I'd probably be one of the first ones to try it, to tell you the truth, if it, if it would work. In a secondary study, the scientists found nerve regeneration in particular is a critical part of the tail regeneration process. Together, these findings may bring researchers closer to solving the challenge of creating the capability for limb or organ regeneration in humans. Guess that means that I don't have to be scared of the garbage disposal anymore. <laughs> and maybe we don't have to worry too much about melting in the Arizona heat. Well, we won't have to worry too much this week because our temperatures this week won't be as bad as they've been. Let's take a look at what our temperatures are going to be for tomorrow. Tomorrow, our high here in Phoenix is going to be 108. Other areas down south are also going to be experiencing those triple digits. So if you want to escape that heat, I suggest going up north because they're going to be getting some mid to high 80s as well as mid to high 90s. But over the next couple of days, we are going to have clear skies Thursday and Friday and then rain coming in on Saturday. But don't let that rain fool you because we are going to be at a high of 111. Throughout the rest of the week, we're going to see clouds coming in and out. So we might see more rain throughout the week. Let's hope. But our lows will be in those high 80s. For you weather report, I'm Nikisha Johnson at Cronkite News. We want to see your monsoon photos or videos. Just tag Cronkite News, message us, or reply back to this tweet with your content, and you may see it on one of our newscasts, on Arizona PBS, or on our website. The Phoenix Mercury on the move. That's right, they're going to be relocating. We'll tell you where they're going after the break. Welcome to another edition of Cronkite Sports Now. I'm Taylor Rocha. Let's talk sports. For the latest on local sports and beyond, we've got you covered. Let's do this thing. We challenge reporters to go beyond you know, a game story. We want stories with depth. It's just a really a crucial step from the college um, experience into the professional experience while you're still in school. At Cronkite Sports Now, watch the journalists of tomorrow cover sports today. Stay in the know, on the go. At Cronkite News, we work hard to report the facts and keep you updated, whether we're on set or on the scene. Taking it from the studio to the field. So I'm here in South Phoenix. In Phoenix, we're just a click away. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. With $230 million in renovations to Talking Stick Resort Arena in the works, the Phoenix Mercury is making a move for the 2020 season. Reporter Kyla Wilcher checked out the Mercury's new home. Kyla? That's right, the Mercury are moving to Veterans Memorial Coliseum for the 2020 season. The Coliseum has a reputation for its loud and intense environment and is even referred to as the Madhouse on McDowell. I checked out the unveiling of the return of the Madhouse. Go Mercury! Next season, the Mercury will take up residence at the original home of Arizona professional basketball. Veterans Memorial Coliseum hosted the Phoenix Suns from their inaugural season in 1968 until 1992. Finding a temporary venue was an important choice for our organization to make, and having the opportunity to add to the history of the Madhouse on McDowell, which was created by Al McCoy, the Suns' radio announcer, made this the right place. Mercury Center Brittany Griner first set foot in the Coliseum today. She's excited about her new home court and hopes the move helps expand the Mercury fan base. So I know we always have home court advantage, I feel like, with our fans. But even here, I think we're going to be able to yell them out of the gym. This is the first basketball game in the Coliseum since the Suns took on the Portland Trail Blazers in the 1992 NBA playoffs. Former Suns center Mark West, who played in that playoff series, says there is no environment quite like the Madhouse. My hope is that you 
bring a championship to this building. It deserves one. You're definitely a team that can do that, and I wish you all the, the luck in the world. General Manager Jim Pittman says the Mercury plan to add a new scoreboard and sound system, and even put up the team's championship banners in the Coliseum, all to make it feel like home. With the fans virtually right on top of the action, combined with the amenities the Mercury will add to the building and the nostalgia of basketball's return, we are confident in the home court advantage that awaits us. The Coliseum will host preseason, regular season, and playoff home games for the 2020 WNBA season. The team is bringing its own court to help make it a smooth transition. In the newsroom, Kyla Wilcher, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS News Network. On the next Arizona Horizon, special counsel Robert Mueller appears again before the U.S. House of Representatives. We will have full analysis of special counsel Mueller's testimony on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Amna Nawaz. On the next News Hour, Robert Mueller testifies. Join us for live coverage starting at 8.30 a.m. plus full analysis. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.